Remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. These are the words that we use as we enter into this holy season of Lent today with the dusty reminder of our humanity and our mortality. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't typically go around remembering my mortality on a moment-by-moment -moment basis every day of my life. And thank goodness for that, because I can imagine how hard that would be. In fact, I got to know a community while I was living and working in Boston that does have to practice that every day, every day being confronted by their mortality. Some of you know that I just moved here from Boston, and there I was working with a church called Common Cathedral that centers the experience and the people who are chronically homeless on the streets of Boston. And this is a church that worships outdoors on Boston Common every single Sunday and allows every member of the congregation to participate in the service by offering their own thoughts at the sermon or by offering their own prayers into the microphone at the prayers of the people. Things that would terrify most Episcopal congregations if I started walking around with a microphone during church. And yet it was really meaningful for that community who so often is voiceless. And because they were able to offer their stories in such an honest and humble way, I came to understand a little bit what it is like for people who do have to confront their mortality on a daily basis. I remember so often through the months of winter when people, every person, would pray during the prayers of the people for their digits, praying that people would make it through the season of winter with all of their fingers and toes, knowing that that would not be true for every person at that service that that many of those fingers and toes would be lost to frostbite by the time the daffodils began to poke up in the spring. But I think perhaps one of the most moving stories I got to hear was when Maria, names have been changed for privacy and dignity, of course, when Maria got up during the sermon and shared her story of the night before. Not unlike the city of Erie, Boston gets some pretty good winter weather snow and cold, and the night before had been particularly bitter. And she had woken up in the middle of the night in her usual doorway and had become aware that the foot warmers that she had had already become useless against the cold, having lost all of their warmth. She noticed that she could no longer feel her fingers and toes. And she had a moment of wonder of wondering if she was even able to fall back asleep in this bitter cold, if she would wake up in the morning, or if this would be the winter night that she would die of the cold and just never wake up. And it was humbling to be in a worship service and hear someone offer this very brave and honest story to a congregation of people and to all of the strangers walking around on Boston Common. And hearing stories like this have deepened my own experience of Ash Wednesday from that time forward. Because this cross that we receive on our foreheads of ash remind me of mortality in a much deeper and more concrete way than it had previously. I have the privilege of not having to remember my mortality daily. I have the privilege of not being constantly mired in the ways that the world is broken and the ways that I contribute to that brokenness. So this symbol of this dusty cross today is a reminder of my humanity and my mortality in very real ways. But wearing ashes, of course, is often a reminder of mourning, a symbol of mourning. And we can mourn today. We can mourn the loss of fingers and toes this winter, both in the city of Boston and in the city of Erie. We can mourn for the people who are sleeping outside and will not wake up the next morning because of the bitter cold. We can mourn the people who used to be in the pews around us, in our own community, in our own families, that are no longer with us. And we can mourn for the ways that we are 
broken, for our, for our own shortcomings, for the ways that we participate in the brokenness in the world around us. And isn't that part of what the season of Lent is all about? Remembering the ways that we are broken and being penitent and showing ways that we can continue to be better and to make the world a better and more beautiful place. But it's a little odd, I think, that given what we are here to do this evening, we read this gospel from Jesus every year on Ash Wednesday. This gospel that on the surface seems to say, do not practice your piety before others. Do not flaunt your Episcopalianness, your Christianity to others. And yet here we are today gathered awaiting that moment in the service when we will receive those dusty crosses on our forehead. Dark marks that will show the world as we leave this church and go back out into our lives exactly who we are. That will show the world that we are people of faith and that we are practicing a particular piety on this day in the church year. So what is that really about? Because that's a little concerning to me, both as a priest and as someone who used to pray literally on a street corner in the city of Boston with tons of people walking by. What is Jesus getting at here? Jesus, who also prayed and taught publicly. There's got to be more to it than that surface understanding. Perhaps you noticed it, though. Jesus tells his followers, beware of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them. Whenever you give alms, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do, so that they may be praised by others. Whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in, in the religious gatherings and at the street corners so that they may be seen by others. Whenever you fast, do not look dismal like the hypocrites to show others that they are fasting. Did you notice the pattern there? It seems to me that what Jesus is teaching about is not so much about how we practice our piety, but about the intent behind our actions rather than the actions themselves. It's about how we flaunt our faith to others. But for me, receiving this Ash Cross on Ash Wednesday is not about flaunting my faith, but it's about remembering for myself what my faith is. It's a symbol not just of our humanity and mortality and mourning of our brokenness, but it's also a symbol of who we are of our identity as beloved children of God who were created carefully by a God who loves us, who are wonderfully formed from the dust of the universe. For me, this ash cross tonight makes visible another cross. You may or may not remember receiving the cross of your chrism at your baptism, the cross of oil, that is received on the forehead in the same place that we mark with ashes tonight. A cross that isn't very often visible and can be easily forgotten. A cross that reminds us of our identity in God. Or perhaps as the physicist Neil deGrasse Tyson puts it so beautifully, the atoms of our bodies are traceable to stars that manufactured them in their cores and exploded these enriched ingredients across our galaxy. For this reason, we are biologically connected to every other living thing in the world. We are chemically connected to all molecules on Earth. And we are atomically connected to all atoms in the universe. We are not figuratively, but literally, stardust. We are wonderfully created by a loving God from the stardust of the universe. We are all connected, both in our brokenness and in our beauty and belovedness. These ashes that will make visible the cross of our chrism remind us of that paradox that we hold within us, that we are both broken and beautiful, that we are both saints and sinners, 
that we are both fallen and redeemed all at the same time. And it reminds us of that baptismal covenant that we make to love each other, to strive for justice and peace, to respect the dignity of all of those people and creatures that we are connected to biologically, chemically, and atomically. Remember that you are stardust, and to stardust you shall return.